Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at some clutch chess openings. So, these, of course, are the openings used in the big clutch chess finals match that just took place between Magnus Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana. And it was a very exciting match. Of course, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, there were five out of six decisive games in the final day. Uh, and in particular, I really wanted to look at the openings that were played when Fabiano had the white pieces. And of course, we're also going to take a look at a, a couple different uh, openings when Magnus had the white pieces. But in, particu in particular, I like focusing on these three Fabi games because both of the players were very consistent with their openings. And you can see how they adapted as the match continued. As uh, you know, each player started showing some new ideas, they started coming up with some new ways to combat those. So let's jump right into it. Now, this first game, I believe, was game number seven. So this was the first game of the final day, if I'm recalling correctly. Uh, so Fabi has the white pieces. He plays this move, e4, uh, which, of course, you probably have seen before. And then Magnus goes for c5. Now we have knight f3. Magnus has been playing knight c6. And Fabi is a big Rosalimo player with bishop b5. Now there are a ton of ways that black can respond to the Russell Limo. Uh, g6, for example, the most popular move, e6, d6, just knight f6, queen b6. You can play so, so many moves here. Uh, but Magnus chooses none of the above, and he plays the slightly strange looking move e5. Uh, and now we have a very, very strange looking position that could actually be gotten from a 1e4, e5. Uh, well, actually, it couldn't really be gotten unless you get there from a very strange move order because the knight would be attacking this pawn before this pawn could launch out to c5. So the idea of this opening for Magnus, there are uh, kind of a few ideas. The main point, of course, is the difference in the Roy Lopez is that we have this pawn on c5 instead of c7. So Magnus is going to claim that that's like a really useful advantage. You know, having this pawn on c5 means that this d4 square is going to be well under black's control for the immediate future, meaning it might be slightly more difficult for white to play things like an early d4, an early c3, d4, because black does have this extra pawn controlling this square. Uh, the downside to this is, of course, you are spending some time. Uh, and with this pawn already being on c5, uh, it really does become clear that this bishop is going to be more or less the, the kind of problem piece for black in this case. Now the c5 square is uh, very often a square that this bishop can jump out to in openings like the Italian or the slower e4, e5 positions, and even you'll see this bishop come out to b4, uh, rarely if a knight lands on c3 or something. But with the pawn on c5, none of those options available to black. And so the, the story of this is going to be of this bishop, also of the time spent uh, moving this c5 pawn here. It is actually going to give black uh, some minor difficulties in the center because he has spent some more time and has not yet adequately really defended this pawn. Uh, now, bishop takes c6 is a playable move right off the bat, and after d takes c6, you really don't want to capture this pawn due to these ideas, uh, due to these ideas of queen d4 attacking both the knight and the pawn. Uh, but bishop takes c6 is fine, and you can play d3, and this is a position uh, that probably a lot of uh, Russell Nemo players would be quite uh, happy with. You know, you trade the bishop off for the knight, you get the, the fractured pawn structure on the queen side for your opponent. And you can continue playing chess from, uh, from here. Instead, though, Fabi just castles. And now Magnus is still faced with these awkward difficulties of developing this bishop. And so he brings this bishop out to d6, solving two problems at once, giving this bishop a square, and also defending the e5 pawn. Now, uh, of course, this looks like a very, very unnatural developing move at, at first glance here. This bishop comes out to d6. It's not really looking at any open diagonals at all. It's kind of stuck be behind these pawns. But it is a very useful piece here. And it's important to understand that in a lot of these e4, e5 positions, uh, this bishop gets moved around quite a bit, 
Uh, for example, when you see it come out to c5, very often it is later followed up with a move like a6 and a bishop dropping back to a7, occasionally even all the way back to b8 or c7, depending on the case. Uh, it also, in some cases, you'll see a rook e8 and the bishop dropping back to f8, because really, in these openings, this bishop is not quite comfortable being so, so far outside the pawn chain. So this bishop on d6, in black's eyes, is just going to be a temporary misplacement of the bishop, and then eventually that bishop is going to get back into a more natural square, but it's serving a very nice temporary role defending the e5 pawn. d3 now for white is a nice, simple developing move by Fabi. Now we have knight g to e7. Uh, was not played. This is, sorry, uh, generally uh, a common developing square for the knight. And we'll see why black does end up putting this knight on e7 uh, in the next game. But due to Fabi's move order, uh, black is actually allowed to place the knight onto f6 here instead. And the fact of the matter is, um, very often when you play systems like these, you just kind of say, okay, my bishop goes here, my knight goes here behind it on e7, and then I just develop and castle and, and play from there. But it's important to look out for these opportunities uh, early on in the game because just via chess understanding, uh, it's very, very clear that f6 is a better square than e7 if we can attain it. Uh, so the question kind of arises, well, why does the knight ever go to e7? And hold tight on that question. We're going to really go in-depth in that in the second game I, I want to look at. And now, in my opinion, after this knight lands on the f6 square, uh, black has more or less nothing to worry about here. The downside, uh, as opposed to coming to e7, is that this pin does kind of gain in strength a little bit uh, as, you know, there's never going to be any f6 to uh, break this pin. And moving the queen out of the pin is also going to be a bit more difficult, because now a capture on e7 fractures the pawns rather than a capture on, uh, a, fracture on f a capture on f6 fractures the, fractures the pawns, whereas a capture on e7 would not do so. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, so bishop g5 is Fabi's choice, and this is the justification for allowing the knight to come to f6, but it becomes very, very clear in this game that after bishop h4, we see black kick the other bishop around as well, and now black can just drop this bishop back to e7. Uh, and unfortunately, there's just no issues here for black now. He got the bishop back to a natural square, he dealt with the problem of the e5 pawn by moving this bishop away, he dealt with the pin by dropping the bishop back, he's now free, to think about ideas of d6 or d5, even expanding on the queen side with b5, and this is just going to be a good version of e4, e5 systems. Of course, many e4, e5 Roy Lopez players with black will know that oftentimes this black knight moves out of the way so the pawn can come out to c5 and then will even jump right back on occasion. So this is now just a good version for black. Having this pawn on c5 is going to be a positional advantage rather than disadvantage. And all those downsides that we saw coming with it, you know, the weakness on e5, the problem of the bishop, well, those have been pretty well solved now by black. So that is what Fabi should have been trying to avoid. Uh, and as you can probably see the result on your screen, uh, this comfortable opening position did turn out to be a very, very nice win for Magnus. The game continued with c3, still going for these d4 breaks. We have castles by black, uh, knight bd2 by white, the simple d6 by black, just completing development now. Uh, a4 is an attempt to slow down these queenside pawn storms. And now the move knight h5 comes by black. And this is uh, now just solidly middle game play by Magnus here. Uh, he dealt with all these opening problems. He has good control of the d4 square for the moment, and now he just goes about uh, trading off his bad pieces for white's active pieces and improving his own pieces uh, in the process. Uh, Fabi opted for bishop g3, trying to keep this bishop on the board. And now the move g6 by black is a nice one to solidify this knight. Uh, leave this bishop open for the moment and leave these ideas of knight takes g3 and knight f4 alive for the moment. Rook e1 is supporting the e-pawn, still just preparing this d4 break by Fabi, but really, uh, he has achieved nothing out of this opening, and we do see knight takes g3, pawn takes g3, and now black can even just play moves like king g7. Uh, and this is kind of the power of Magnus's opening choice here. 
it looks awfully, awfully risky to be going for so much with both c5 and e5, having to draw this bishop out to d6. But this is what it looks like when it goes well. Uh, Magnus has absolutely no problems out of this opening. He's going to have very active play on the queen side now, and we'll see that this just turns into a win for him. So this should have more or less been a word of warning for Fabi, seeing how well Magnus actually used this slightly unorthodox system to his advantage, and we'll definitely see that he does improve on it in the next couple games. In the meantime, though, let's see how this game wrapped up. Uh, I say wrapped up, there's quite a lot of chess left to be played, but as far as our opening class is concerned, knight f1 was played, and then h5, knight e3, Fabi is rerouting, trying to make use of the d5 weakness. Now h4, Magnus does not give a care for what Fabi is doing in the center, just expanding on the, the king side. We have takes, takes. Now g3 by Fabi, bishop back to g5. We do see this trade. And now after queen f3, uh, I'll ask you guys at home to try and find the key move here for black. This is kind of the natural continuation of black's plan so far. He closed down the center with his opening play with c5 and e5. Then he expanded on the king side with h5, h4, and taking on uh, h4. And so what is the follow-up now? How does black continue this king side attack? What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, and the YouTube chat already has it. Uh, Manny, LP, and Denny Ortiz, both with the move f5. This is the move played in the game, and it is, uh, I think, the best move for Magnus. It's the most uh, logical continuation of the play. f5, just continuing to open things up, using this nice active queen over here, using our nice bishop, whereas this bishop on c4 now starts to look a little bit out of place. Uh, there's this term for bishops, where when they're staring at really, really solid pawns, they're biting on granite. You know, uh, for example, like a bishop on a3 would be biting on granite, right? Can't get past the c5 pawn. This bishop on c4 sort of has the opposite problem, where it's, it's biting on, on thin air, right? You know, nothing to really chomp down on here, uh, whether it's rock or, you know, uh, even a king. Nothing really doing for this bishop. And that's why that, uh, that's why white is really just not doing very well here. Black has the, all the space and the better pieces. We see e takes f5, now bishop takes f5, knight f5, rook f5, queen g2, rook a f8, rook e2, rook f3, rook a to e1. And then I don't want to spoil anything for the tactics class coming up here because Magnus uh, does play a very, very nice move to continue the attack here. But jumping ahead, uh, we did see Magnus break through and go up the exchange and go on to win this game. If you want to see the killer tactic, stay tuned for the next class because we're also going to be going over the key tactics from this match. And of course, Magnus wins this endgame with a little bit of difficulty. So to recap this game, the story was Magnus going for the early c5 to control d4. Fabi unable to punish the awkward placement of this bishop allowed black to develop naturally, and because of that, black got a very comfortable position and managed to convert it into a win because he is the world champion. Uh, and that's just what he does. Mm -hmm. Also, nice idea by black that you should probably keep in mind, this idea of knight h5 just to resolve this tension between these bishops and to get this knight to a nice active square where it can look at squares like f4. Uh, okay, moving on to game two, uh, meaning I think not game two, but uh, game nine, I believe, in the match, if I'm getting it correctly. I think, ah, Ben Simon claims the last game was game nine. I don't know then. Uh, <laughs> all right. In this game, things went a little bit differently. Uh, we have knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, e5, castles, bishop d6. So, so far, everything is exactly the same. Now, in the previous position, Fabi essayed the move d3, and here, uh, Magnus replied with the move knight f6. Uh, and this turned out to be a little bit of a problem for Fabi. You know, not a problem in the classical sense where it's threatening something, but just because uh, black is able to develop to natural squares and has this extra positional boon to, uh, to boot with this pawn on c5. So, I'll challenge you guys at home to find the opening subtlety here. Uh, what move can you play here to... Uh, make knight f6 look a little bit less appealing. What move can you play 
to make knight f6 seem a little bit worse than, than normal. And I'll give you a brief, brief hint here. It takes advantage of this bishop on d6. And this is why I think this is the best move in the position. That's why Fabi switched uh, to it, or at least switched back to it, depending on the, the game order here. Any chance these classes could be a little bit earlier? Uh, well, sorry to hear that, X row. You can't always watch the, the VODs, but um, I guess it's kind of a, a remnant of bygone eras. We have the classes kind of in the evening here because when the club is open, we do want people to come attend in person and we want to give them some time, you know, after 5 p.m., after they get off work to come out and come down to the club. Uh, we are, you know, kind of foremost a chess club. And then uh, we do like providing you guys with all this online entertainment, but uh, that's kind of why we have all these classes sort of at the same time every night. Okay, there's some uh, ideas in the chat, though. Uh, the move C3 is being mentioned, the move H3 and G4 is being mentioned uh, with some pretty direct threats to the knight. C4 even got a mention. And the move Knight A3 is also getting mentioned. Knight A3 is a really interesting one. Uh, I'm not certain it actually prevents the move knight f6, though. I think uh, we might still be able to get away with this move. And now, because you brought your knight out here, it's true you can come to c4 and challenge my pieces, but you are sort of leaving this guy behind for a moment. So you can imagine something like this. And hold on, let's see where this bishop goes. I think, yeah, just back to c7. You can get uh, a funny line like this, but at, at the end of the day, you are going to have to defend this guy. And you get some sort of Rosalimo type positions where you do, in fact, actually have this trade of the bishop for the knight on c6. It's certainly one way of playing. It's not a bad way of playing. It's not what I had in mind here, though. Uh, specifically, I wanted to uh, discourage the move knight f6. And while g4, g5 might you know, discourage knight f6, I, I, I don't think we want to be doing this to our king's side. So the move is, in fact, going to be the move c3. And at first, it's not entirely obvious, you know, what's the connection between the move c3 and the move knight f6, and especially this bishop on d6. Well, the point is, everybody knows the tactic where a pawn forks two pieces by moving up in the center and attacking them at the same time. And the idea here is, is simply no different. If you play the move knight f6, you're going to get met with the move d4. And if you're not careful... <laughs> You have no good way to kind of solve this issue on the e5 square. I don't even think we need to include the move bishop takes c6. Just c takes d4 immediately. And this move d takes e5 is going to be coming with authority. Uh, and this is really what black has to look out for. There's no time to castle, uh, as you will now be met with this move. And now here would be winning a piece. If you try to take on e4, well, look out. Because, you know, <laughs> the downside to not castling is that you do leave your king in the center. In d takes e5 is going to be a powerful move. So this is the opening subtlety that really changes the story here. With c3, we can now ensure that the black knight is not going to be quite so happy coming to this f6 square. And for that reason, we do actually see the world champion uh, play the move first a6, bishop back to a4 b5, bishop back to c2, and now the move knight g to e7. Uh, if knight to f6 here, well, you're facing the same issues of d4 still coming. Uh, this bishop, not totally necessary for these tactics to sort of make some waves here. For example, uh, castles takes, we wouldn't be winning a piece here anymore, but due to the awkward placement of this bishop, winning the bishop pair would be very, very uh, comfortable now for white, especially with the wide open center. So. Knight e7 instead. Uh, and now Fabi goes back to his old ways, just plays the move d3, and prepares to develop naturally. Uh, in the game, we do see knight g6 from uh, the world champion. And oh my goodness, I'm mixing up my games here. But no need to worry, because I think knight g6 is the novelty in this game. So I'm going to drive Ben Simon crazy and switch games really quickly here. D3, we had this position. This is the game I wanted to look at. And in this I game, opening, yeah, no, it's the same position, which is why I got it confused. But I think this is the earlier game. And in this game, uh, Magnus Carlsen played castles. Fabi develops naturally with bishop e3. And Magnus plays bishop b7. And we'll see why in a moment in the other game, the world champion switched to knight g6. 
So here, I want you to find Fabi's next move. Uh, it's a pretty nice idea by White. It shows you where White wants to be playing on the board, what White wants to be doing. So go ahead, take a moment here, and try and find White's idea. Looks like a Roy Lopez note. Yeah, this line does transpose into a lot of Roy Lopez lines. Like I was saying, the key differences are the placement of these two pieces. And now, thanks to Fabi's slightly more accurate uh, move order, the difference is also this knight being on e7 rather than f6. So uh, I see a lot of one moves being suggested, and the right move, I believe, is already in the chat. But try and take a second and figure out what you want to do with the rest of your pieces as well. Specifically, look at these two pieces and think to yourself, what new options are available to me with these uh, two pieces being slightly misplaced? So a lot of people are, there seems to be sort of a, a four-way split. One part of the camp wants to play the move knight d2, and I'm not going to tell you that this is a bad move. It's a perfectly reasonable move, but it's perhaps missing the opportunity that Magnus allowed here. The move a4, I think, is, is pretty common for these Spanish positions, trying to break down this b5 pawn. But it's not really going to be our idea here. You know, playing on the queen side doesn't really make use of, of these pieces being out of the way here. So, of course, the correct move is uh, the move that Fabi played in the game. It's a move being suggested quite a lot. It's the move knight h4. Knight h4 is a really, really great idea here for white. And it really does make use of the awkward placement of black's pieces. And this is the idea that I want you guys to try and take away uh, and use in your own games, hopefully. Uh, if you do find yourself playing against uh, something very, very similar to an opening, very similar to the Roy Lopez in this case, but with some pieces slightly differently placed, be sure to look at those differences and see what new options are available to you. That's really a, a great way to navigate both openings and middle game positions. Uh, it's all about relating what you see on the board to what you already know. So you say, okay, with a knight on f6 and a bishop on e7, you know, these pieces are, are well placed. The bishop does a good job of controlling these dark squares. This knight, in the meanwhile, controls g4 and h5. So with these pieces sort of lacking, now we can play knight h4 a lot more easily. And in fact, we can even bring this queen out to g4. Uh, and this is the key move that nobody in the chat really mentioned, to my knowledge. But this is a, a really key idea here, in my opinion, for white. The lack of the knight on f6 is a really, really important defender that's just not there. Uh, and that's why Fabi gets a good position in this game and gets a good attack and does manage to convert it. So, uh, in the game, Magnus played rook e8. Fabi does take the time out of his day to play knight d2. And now we do see knight g6 come on the board, but it's a little too late now. As soon as the knight vacates the f5 square, uh, our knight is ready to jump in. We see bishop f8, and now this move queen g4 does finally come on the board. And this is just a hugely pleasant position now for white. Uh, and this is the, the main point of, of the lecture here to, tonight. It's, well, one, just to enjoy these openings played. But this, I believe, is the most instructive point, making use of the differences in positions from what you already know. You know where these pieces belong in the Roy Lopez. You know where they normally go. And now you see, well, wait, these pieces look slightly different. And then you can take advantage of it as Fabi does here. And this is the killer opening play that gives Fabi an advantage in this game d6, and now I'm sure everybody at home already knows uh, the next couple moves that are coming on the board. Well, at least the, the next one uh, is the move everybody wants to play in this position. Of course, I'm talking about the move h4. Uh, you go after this knight on g6 and go after the king. If you ever see a knight planted on g6 and it's in the way of your attack, h4, h5, that's almost always the way to go to get rid of this knight. We do have king h8 now from the world champion. Of course, h4 did make a threat. Does anybody see the threat? 
if, uh, let's say, black just passes here, just plays like rook b8. Who sees the threat? Who sees the threat? Do you guys see it at home? What you got? <laughs> All right, I'm just going to reveal it. Don't want to spend too much time here on tactics. We, of course, would play h5, and then knight h6 check. Knight takes f7 check, and that is going to be a winner for white. So, of course, Magnus doesn't allow this. Plays king h8. Now, if a knight lands on h6, it will, in fact, be captured. So, bishop b3 is a really great move by Fabi. Switching diagonals back to b3, challenging this pawn on f7 now that its only defender has left. Uh, black plays queen c7, and from here, it's just a masterclass in attacking from Fabiano. Knight f3, bringing more pieces into the attack. Knight a5, we do just see bishop d5 now by Fabi. Bishop takes d5, pawn takes d5, f6, now h5 is uh, removing this knight. Knight e7, knight takes e7, queen takes e7, knight h4. We have queen up to f7, c4 by white, takes, takes, now e4 by black. And for those of you who may have already seen the games live, Magnus did actually miss an opportunity to get back into the game, which I'm going to talk about in tactics class, but it doesn't really have much to do with the opening play. So b3 by white now, defends on c4, king g8, bishop back to d2, and the story really is just that all of these pieces are bad, and these pieces are good. And Fabi does win the game from here. Knight b7, bishop c3, rook e5. Uh, Magnus felt the need to sacrifice in exchange, and from here it is just a technically winning position for Fabi. Takes, takes. And there was some practical difficulty. It took Fabi a little bit of maneuvering around, but he does come up with this nice b4 idea to uh, break the blockade on these dark squares, breaking through onto the e5 square. And from here, he does manage to convert d7, d8, and that is an extra queen for Fabiano. So the difference here in this game from game one, c3, this is the really, really key move. Uh, defending the d4 square, and now with this, very much discouraging move, knight f6, due to this nice idea of d4. So this brings the knight to e7 instead, and now d3, and Ma Fabi makes use of this misplaced knight. Now, uh, I know Ben said this one was game 11, but I am almost entirely sure that's not quite accurate, because I'm 100% certain that this game was game 11, but we'll sort this one out. <laughs> um, so. In this last game I want to look at today, this, I, I'm, I'm really sure on this one, was game 11 of the match, the penultimate round. Fabiano was in almost a must-win situation. He was down one point going into these last two rounds, which were both worth three points due to the format of the tournament. So with a win here, he would be in a very, very good spot to win the match. Uh, and so what did he pull out? The same stuff he had been playing, e4, c5. And we get an identical position uh, except this got messed up just a bit. Okay, we get an identical position with c3. Uh, a6, bishop back. b5, bishop back. Knight g e7. Now, d3 from Fabiano. And, you know, Magnus fool him once, but uh, tough to fool him twice. Uh, he can't get fooled again, as a certain president would say. Uh, knight g6. And this was Magnus's big improvement on the previous position. Now, not allowing white to play this nice move, knight h4, get this kind of bind on the king side, get these pieces activated really, really quickly. Instead, playing an early, early knight g6 and going for the uh, a slightly more restrictive approach on the king side rather than just ignoring it and playing these developing moves like castles in bishop b7 immediately. In the game, Fabi just develops with the move bishop e3, castles, knight bd2, now bishop e7. <laughs> and Fabi does something really, really interesting here. So black, of course, took a very conservative approach to the king side after the fiasco that happened in that last game that we looked at. So not as easy to kind of contest 
this king side here for white. So with that in mind, what do you guys think Fabi should do here? Should he still try and push through on the king side using uh, a different, you know, maneuver? Should he try to switch to the to the queen side? Should he try to switch to the center? And how should he go about doing these things? Uh, let me know what you guys think here in the chat. A couple fans of the move a4, there's one fan of the move knight b3, which does make a threat. Uh, rook e1, knight f1, knight g3 is a maneuver that's been suggested, aiming for this f5 square. h3, d4, so some good ideas here. Uh, these are all kind of classical Roy Lopez you know, ideas, plans. Uh, in positions like these. Uh, however, I'm going to ask you once again to fall back on this method I was talking about in the previous game. Fabi came up with the move knight h4 uh, and queen g4, and at least my thought process following these moves is you look at the difference of the pieces and then try to take advantage of it. But now, you know, we know a little bit about the position that we just had. This is now game 11, you know, we have this uh, knowledge banked. And what's the difference uh, in this position compared to the last position? Well, black has spent two full tempi on the king's side rather than spending these tempi developing elsewhere. And because black has spent these tempi on the king's side, it does make sense that he's less equipped to deal with threats in the center, right? This bishop's not yet on the b7 square. This bishop has dropped back, no longer defending e5. This knight has also left the defense of the d5 square. And so the center is now where Fabi decides to make his break. Uh, and that's a really, really sensible approach. It all comes back to relating these positions to what you already know. And from there, as you play more and more games, play more positions in these openings, you start to really understand more and more ideas and become better equipped to handle these sort of curveballs that inevitably get thrown at you, right? Nobody always gets a game in their prep. But this is how you can start to develop that really solid knowledge base and be able to handle differences in the opening. So here, uh, Fabi first decided to focus on this d5 square. This knight, of course, leaving the d5 square, the bishop not yet on b7. He plays the move bishop b3. Uh, and it's a really interesting maneuver here by Fabi, bringing the bishop back out and now aiming for the d5 square. He's made it very, very difficult. Uh, well, Magnus has made it very, very difficult for himself to get back to a square on e7 with a knight, so it's difficult to challenge a bishop landing on d5. So after d6, we do, in fact, see the move bishop d5 with threats along this diagonal. Uh, Magnus came up with the move queen e8, and now I'm sure you guys at home know the follow-up here for Fabi. This is the key break in the position, uh, making use of the fact that the black pieces have sort of evacuated the center just a little bit. So here, of course, the move is d4, breaking in the center. Uh, and I can't stress it enough, you can come up with these ideas by relating positions to positions you've already seen, positions you've already known. And this is another reason why it's so critical to analyze your games after you play them, your, your tournament games at the very least. Because if you analyze them and understand what happened in the opening, then you do increase your sort of knowledge base you get to understand more and more and more and be able to handle these types of positions. But okay, so d4 is the big break, making use of the fact that the black pieces are sort of underdeveloped comparatively, right? You're used to seeing these positions with like a rook on e8, maybe the bishop back on f8, this knight on f6, this bishop back on c2. You know, if those four things were all different, then maybe this would be just a dead equal position for black, or maybe black would be, I don't know, trying to be, play for an advantage somehow. I, I doubt it. But those four things are kind of missing, right? And those are definitely worse changes for black than better. So e takes d4 now. We have c takes d4. Rook b8. 
and now rook to c1 by Fabi. And uh, I think Fabi at this point does just have a pleasant position. Now, I don't think Magnus has done things uh, really, really terribly wrong yet, so I don't think black is like losing or anything. Uh, in that first game, things did sort of go very wrong very fast for him, but here there's, there's still a chess game to be played, but I definitely would prefer the white position with this strong bishop on d5, this extra central control, and this now active rook on the c1 square. So the game continued with knight b4, trying of course to get rid of this bishop, and Fabi takes this opportunity to capture on c5, and after takes, uh, sorry, takes here first, uh, bishop takes, knight takes d5, e takes d5, rook takes, uh, bishop takes, rook takes. Uh, for the moment, Fabiano is just up a clean d pawn. Uh, Magnus felt that his position was bad enough that he needed to just get rid of this bishop at all costs, sacrificing the c5 pawn, and Fabi does now have a, a pretty good position and goes on to win this game. Uh, bishop b7, this knight comes to b3, supporting this rook and supporting this pawn. Uh, queen d7, knight a5, bishop a8, knight c6, uh, rook b to e8, knight f d4, queen d6, b4, and this is just dead busted for black. Skipping ahead here, don't want to spend too much time. We do see that uh, Fabi eventually wins this game with some nice sacrifices here. Uh, knight takes e8, rook back to e7 with the pin, but we just sacrificed the queen now. Rook takes b7. And then as I was watching this game live, I really, really, really wanted Fabiano to play knight f6 because I thought it looked cool, but this move doesn't even win because there's an escape square for the king. So he plays the much better move, knight e to d6, which does win with these threats uh, to the queen. Uh, now, if you play a move like queen f6, rook c8, check, king h7. And uh, white has two knights and a rook for the queen, which is more than enough. So Fabi did manage to win game 11. But, you know, uh, I was watching the chat room, actually, uh, of the Clutch Chess broadcast uh, to see what they were all doing in there. And there seem to be a lot of accusations that this channel is biased towards Fabiano. I don't know where that came from. Maybe they saw that we printed Team Fabi shirts when he was in the World Championship. Maybe that gave them the idea, but I don't know. But enough of this Fabi bias. Let's take a look at some games played by the World Champion with the white pieces now. Uh, that kind of wraps up that Roy Lopez uh, or Weird Sicilian uh, openings. And now we're going to take a look at Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces playing actually the English with some slightly offbeat lines. So jumping into that, we have the move c4, e5, knight c3, knight f6, g3, bishop b4. Uh, and so this is a pretty interesting approach to the English, uh, particularly because of Magnus's next move. It may look slightly familiar to you, who just saw the last three games. He plays the move e4. <laughs> Uh, of course, you know, this move does seem to break the same principles that we talked about in the previous games, and it is sort of a reversed position of that opening line that we talked about. The difference here is that the character of this position is going to be totally, totally different. You do have some reversed positions that maintain sort of the same ideas. That's not really going to be the case here. In this case, because white does have this extra tempo, black does have to play a lot more conservatively than we saw Fabiano playing when he had this sort of with the colors reversed, uh, playing, you know, the white side of these kinds of, or, well, still playing, you know, the black side of this, but with the extra tempo because he had the white pieces. So in this case, Fabiano just chops off on c3. We see b takes c3. And now not knight takes e4 again, as the move queen e2 here would be enough to regain the pawn. For example, f5 would start to get a little bit silly with knight f6. Knight takes, or queen takes e5. And this is not really something that, that black wants to go for. You could get some type of endgame, but these are going to be favorable for white with the bishop pair. Uh, so not knight takes e4, rather just castles by black. And now Magnus plays the move f3, which honestly is is not the greatest move in all of chess. 
uh, of course, you know, f3 is a good supporting move towards the center. Uh, you know, we do talk about supporting the center quite often, but in these positions, I do think it makes just more sense to continue developing naturally with a move like bishop g2. And this is very, very well known territory, actually. This knight come out to e2 now, supporting uh, the center. It's a little bit of a different story with this knight coming to e2 rather than f3 here. Here it happens by choice because we don't want to block off our own bishop. And white can just expand in the center uh, in the near future. You know, a move like d5 is likely on black's mind. And you sort of just get everything blowing up here. And this is pretty well known territory. But rather than go for the norm, uh, Magnus decided to shock everyone first with the move f3. Now black responds with the move rook to e8, and this is a, another really instructive move by Fabiano, I, I want to say. Uh, and the reason for that is he's following the same principle that I talked about earlier. You know, he knows this line with bishop g2, I guarantee he knows it because he's just the greatest ever, uh, or at least second greatest ever. Uh, and what's the difference between bishop g2 and f3? Well, Fabiano spots it. White's not developing his pieces in time. This king could get stuck in the center. Thus, the move rook e8, preparing to open up lines to get at this king. Now, what happens if white plays sort of nonchalantly? Well, if you play the move d4, you're already starting to ask for a little bit of trouble with uh, opening up these files in the center. I don't think, though, black actually does want to capture probably just a move like d6. And we are solidifying here, and you do have to look out for the e-file opening. So instead though, Magnus of course played the move king f2, shocking the world in uh, this game. Uh, now Fabiano plays pretty reasonably with c6. We have d4 by white, and now Fabi actually goes for the maximum tension in the center with the move d5. And the move rook e8 again coming in and handy here, supporting this e5 pawn while black expands in the center. and. Uh, this is one of those cases where white has done enough wrong that he's never really going to be pressing for an edge in this particular position. Uh, in the game, c takes d5 happened, c takes d5, d takes c5, rook takes c5, c4, and now this does actually pose uh, one or two problems to black here, because his pieces are very, very temporarily uh, disorganized. You know, this queen is loose on d8, this rook is loose on e5. You do get met with this awkward question of what you're doing with this pawn. There is actually a way, it turns out, for Fabi to solve this idea. He had to find the move queen b6 check, when after bishop to e3, you have to attack this queen with tempo, otherwise we're happy to sort of trade this guy off, I think on e4 rather than c4. But now, queen b2 check, and after the block, Fabi is going to be happy to capture here. And it turns out this tactic just doesn't quite work because of some counter punches on the king's side. For example, bishop takes e5, queen takes f3, king g1, queen e3 check. And this would have been a level way for the game to end. Uh, understandably, Fabi didn't see that far in this rapid game. Said he played d4 in less than 10 seconds. Uh, d4, of course, is the other option here, just preserving this pawn. And now Magnus does actually have a claim to some kind of an edge here. Uh, and that's just down to Fabi perhaps rushing a bit with this break d5. This is actually the only line that really justifies d5 if you see this unpinning technique with the queen. Instead, rather, if Fabi had played the move d6, just taking a slightly slower approach than uh, black would be doing absolutely fine here. Uh, just for example, uh, if, I don't know, some sensible move like bishop d3 gets played, uh, well, bishop d3 would allow d5 because now we don't have this pin, but also just simple development here, knight e2, uh, and we are going to break with d5 once we get just a bit more developed because this pin on the d-file was really the only thing stopping us from, uh, from doing that. So, in the game, though, Fabi played d5, got himself in a little bit of trouble with this pawn on d4. Uh, and let's talk about why that is. Well, 
This pawn on d4 is technically a passed pawn. The issue is it's more of a weakness than a benefit with all of these pieces on the board. Uh, it's not so easy to keep this guy super well defended. And in the meanwhile, it is going to be pretty easy for white to attack this pawn for one, blockade this pawn for two, and play around this pawn. It's not like this pawn is taking away critical squares from the white pieces. So, in the game, knight e2 is played, already attacking this guy. Knight c6, now knight f4, uh, eyes two really key squares. This knight actually dropped back to d7 in the game. And then we saw knight d5 by Magnus, and this is more or less, uh, you know, white's claim to an advantage here. He claims he gets the strong knight on d5, which is unassailable by any of the black pawns, and black is definitely not able to do the same on the d4 square. Uh, okay, so rook e8 was played in the game, and now bishop f4, and white got some nice activity. We saw knight d to e5. We get a trade of the bishop for the knights. Now bishop out to d3, blockading the pawn. And f5 was Fabi's try to create some counterplay. We saw rook e1, f takes e4, bishop takes e4, bishop f5, takes, takes, f4, queen d7, rook b1, rook a to f8, Fabi eyeing this f4 guy. But uh, this is really just going to be a, a good position for Magnus here. King g2, or sorry, King g1 played in the game, rook f7. And I am going to play these through these moves rather quickly, as this is a little bit outside the scope of this openings lecture. Magnus pushes on the king's side eventually, but does not manage to actually get enough. Queens come off the board. You see these guys get traded, and this endgame may be winning, but that is a question for the endgame class. This is not the endgame class. This is the opening class. And out of nowhere, Magnus suddenly hung all of his pawns, and the game was drawn in pretty severe time pressure. <laughs> so that was their first foray into this English with kind of the reversed idea from those first three games we looked at. And then I wanted to take a look at the second game, and this is actually the final game of the entire match. This is where it was all decided. Just some context for you going into this game. Uh, Fabiano, as we saw in this last game, has faced this system from Magnus before. Uh, and the current match situation was Fabiano was, uh, had, had a decisive lead, and Magnus was in a must-win situation. If Magnus drew or lost, Fabi wins the match. If Magnus wins this game, then Magnus wins the match. They were in a pretty unique situation where, you know, a, a tie was impossible, you know, they couldn't tr tie the match anymore, but both players could still win. So Magnus, much win situation, Fabiano, a draw is enough to clinch, and Magnus uh, comes right back out with the move c4. This is game 12, e5, knight c3, knight f6, g3, bishop b4, and e4, the exact same thing we just saw. Uh, Fabi plays the move, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, black went ahead and castled. We did see f3 as in the previous game, and then Fabi uh, had a unique idea sort of in store for Magnus in this case. So in the previous game, we saw the move rook e8, and Fabi got into a fine position, but after d5 did find himself running into a bit of trouble. So perhaps, you know, he went back home and saw that after rook e8, there are more options than just king f2. And honestly, I would be surprised to see Magnus repeat the move king f2. So it sort of makes sense that Fabi wanted to come up with something new here, not wanting to, you know, allow his opponent to deviate first. So rather than rook e8, Fabi comes up with the move b5. And this, at first, is a bit of a stunner. Uh, you know, b5 definitely is not the first move that crosses your mind. And the idea, though, is fairly logical, right? In the previous game, we saw Fabi struggling to get the move d, uh, get the move d5 to work. You know, he ran into this issue of this move c4, an issue he wasn't able to really adequately solve, found himself in a little bit of trouble. So, 
using that as a jumping off point, it's not so ridiculous to come up with the move b5. Uh, relating and learning from previous games. That's what these top players do in these matches. So b5, and the idea, of course, is if you do capture this pawn, you're going to get met immediately with the move d5, and you don't have time for any of your funny business with d4 and potential pins along the d-file. And while this is a pawn sacrifice, it is a pretty comfortable one for uh, Fabi. You can follow it up with a move like a6, for example, takes, knight takes, and as we get developed here, bishop e3, for example, queen e7. Uh, Fabi just enjoys a nice lead in the center and uh, has some quick development in return for the pawn. To continue the line just a bit, knight h3, for example, d4, uh, is creating immediate threats. If you capture this guy, queen b4 check, so bishop back to d2, knight c5, and you can see it's just very comfortable to play now with the black pieces. And this is likely what Fabi was kind of looking forward to playing. Uh, in the game, though, Magnus did not accept the pawn, instead going for d4 immediately. And now, of course, you run into very, very similar problems if you still go for this d5 business. Uh, in the game, Fabi came up with e takes d4, c takes d4, b takes c4, and now e5. Uh, and all of a sudden here, uh, I very much am unsure if Fabi was totally, totally comfortable in this position. He gave uh, an interesting uh, post-game interview, uh, well, post-match interview, actually, and he more or less said, yeah, he, he looked at it, he, he saw this b5 move, it was a good move, and he thought that was just going to be the end of the story. But this is really a wildly imbalanced position here. White, of course, with all of his pieces still sitting on the back rank, but very, very, very solid control of the center. And that's the story in this game. So what were some other options for black here? Well, you could, in a sense, kind of just double down play rook e8 and say you, you are going to want to capture my c5 pawn and then still go in for these types of uh, positions here. But, you know, honestly, I think this move b5 is just asking for a little bit of trouble. It might be that black isn't any worse in this position, but I think it, it's pretty indisputable that black is, is not quite as comfortable as white. Bishop takes c4, challenges this knight, Bishop b7 now by Fabi, developing and defending. Knight h3 is actually the natural developing move in this case. Don't really want to come to e2 and block all your pieces. So knight h3 challenges the g5 square. Can come back to f2 and e4 as well. Can even jump into f4 in some cases. Uh, now, the move d6 is pretty natural by Fabi. Uh, you don't see strong players let these d4, e5 sort of pawn structures exist for too long, they are going to challenge them, and Fabi challenges it as quickly as possible with this king still in the center. Castles now by Magnus, knight d7, rook e1, and after d takes e5, d takes e5, knight 7 to b6, bishop back to b3, queen e7, and in this position, uh, Magnus came up with a, a very, very strong move which uh, I guess I'm going to spoil here. If you're watching the tactics class next, this will make a brief reappearance at the end. But white to move and get a very, very good position here. Uh, it is, of course, going to be the move played in the game e6. Uh, the fact of the matter is when you give up so much central space like Fabi did in this game, you are very much asking for trouble and you have to be on the lookout for these types of sacrifices, these types of moves on every turn. Uh, perhaps, I don't know, maybe slightly better for Fabi was to play the move c5. The idea being now, if you go for similar stuff, we can just take, and we are just in time to lock this bishop out of the game before things get, uh, get too crazy here. Uh, in the game, though, queen e7 was not going to be enough e6 comes on the board, f takes e6, and now knight g5, and white is quite simply crushing in this position. Rook f6, queen c2, rook g6, and then more tactics to follow uh, led to the end of the game 
pretty quickly here with Magnus just going up a queen and finishing uh, Fabi off here. So once again, I really enjoyed looking at these openings uh, in the clutch chess matchup. And if there's any lesson to take away from this, uh, it's that there really is usefulness in analyzing your games. And a lot of that usefulness does come in these opening positions. You take the ideas that you found in your games, you take a look at whether or not they were actually good, whether or not they were actually working, you try to understand why, look at the differences from things you already know, and with time, you start to kind of grow that knowledge base, you start to become a better player, you start to just know these things from the top of your head. If Magnus and Fabi are still doing it at their level, definitely there's still things we can learn at uh, you know our lowly amateur level as well. Uh, that is it for Chess Openings Explained tonight. Thank you guys so much for joining me. If you want to stick around, we are going to be doing a tactics class live on Twitch right after this. Uh, if not, thank you guys once again for joining me. My name is Caleb Dunby, and I will see you next time.